the What to Read Next podcast helps you build a TBR of future favorite books. In each episode, Lori and Maine interviews authors and book influencers to recommend books they loved for you to pick up today. If you're an avid reader, always looking for your next free read, then the show is Hi, Sierra. Hi, Julie. Welcome to What to Read Next podcast. Hi. Thank you so much Hi. for having us. Hello, hello. <laughs> so happy to have you both here. So I've been a huge fan of your individual work. And then when you came together and gave us the photo shoot and the announcement, I was like, I am here for this. <laughs> so this is like a dream come true to have you both here and talk about this project, which, as I mentioned before, I got to read it and I got to listen to it. It is perfection. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So maybe Julie, you go first and then Sierra comes next. Yeah, so we are both former librarians um, who initially started out in the world of young adult books, which is how we met. Um, So I am in Texas. I live here with my spouse and my three cats who are like certifiable. Um, And uh, yeah, there, I mean, I am obsessed with Halloween. I love really spicy books, but never really took the plunge to write one until Sierra was an absolutely filthy influence on me. And here we are. Um, So yeah, we met back in 2014 and it was sort of love at first sight. Um, I'll let Sierra talk a little bit about herself and then we can dive a little more into our own meet cute. (laughs) I mean, you you probably said the stuff that matters. I used to be a librarian. Now I write filthy books. So it's kind of like the two sentence bio. (laughs) Um, But yes, I'm Sierra Simone. I typically write romance that whether it's contemporary or historical is a little bit more taboo on the forbidden edge with a high heat level. And I corrupted Julie Murphy. (laughs) (laughs) and made her and dragged her into the abyss with me um and like she had mentioned we've been friends for a long time we've actually been friends for about eight years and when we met it was because we were doing sort of a DIY bookstore tour that we had put together as authors with our friends uh Tessa Gratton and Natalie Parker and uh Julie and I were gonna have to share a hotel room along the way and it was the first time Julie and I really met And uh, Natalie said, well, I hope it's okay that you guys are going to share a room together because Julie snores. And Julie was like, hello, I'm Julie. I snore right next to Natalie as Natalie was saying this. And then I said, well, that's okay because I have narcolepsy so I can sleep through anything. And it ended up that we were just a match made in heaven. (laughs) And on top of that, like, I hate sharing space with people, like, especially like bedrooms, things like that. And so I was very skeptical of this Sierra Simone person. Uh, But it really like, honestly, within like 12 hours of meeting each other, we were like cuddled up in the backseat of this car, driving across the Midwest to a bookstore, like falling asleep through like laughing at hilarious conversations and like spilling hot chocolate on each other, essentially. Yes. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I love this meet cute. I love that this is a match made in heaven. <laughs> so how did you end up deciding? Well, Sarah, how did you convince Julie to join the filthy side? <laughs> I mean, I say corrupted, but there has never been a more willing heretic than Julie Murphy because she was like, we just needed the right little, you know, needle to to do. Uh, what is it? No, that's the wrong thread. Thread? Yeah, thread. Maybe. Straw yeah. to break the camel's back? Is that there what I was looking for? I was like, needle, hay, straw. I was going to get there. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, what happened was Julie and I are like a match made in heaven in other ways too. And Julie and I have very similar sleep schedules and that we do not sleep in the nighttime, we prefer to sleep a little bit more in the day, like (laughs) vampires. And (laughs) this sometimes puts us at odds with our friends who are like diurnal, they wake up with the sun, they do yoga, they meditate, they go on like a run, and then they write 7000 words. And then they have dinner at five, like normal, healthy people. And so Julie and I have always gone to writing retreats with our friends and been a little bit like, Oh, man, what do us vampires do? (laughs) when everyone else gets up at six and we want to sleep until 11. Uh, So we started doing these little like 
tiny retreats on our own. You could call them back channel retreats, maybe, where we would yeah. just go, just the two of us and keep like our wackadoodle sleep schedule where we would sleep in, but then we would work really late into the night. And we usually just timing wise, these retreats would end up happening around Christmas. And so if we got all of our words in as a reward for ourselves, we would get to eat pie in bed and just watch the absolute like cheesiest, schmaltziest uh, Christmas movies we could find. And we were watching some of these one night and we'd had a lot of pie by this point. That's not even a metaphor. It, like it, it was a lot of pie. <laughs> That's not like a euphemism for the kids. And um we noticed that the Christmas movie productions um, have a pretty similar production quality to maybe some productions that are meant more for like alone time. And <laughs> that sort of became a little bit of like a, a running joke, like, oh, these are not so different. What if someone tried to break into the movie biz to make a quick buck, you know, who had already like established themselves as like an adult entertainment, you know? mogul and that was how the idea started like spiraling out and once we had landed on this sort of silly happy christmas story i mean i think julie was yeah was old <laughs> i mean i well i love the idea because you know we kept spitballing this and like suddenly it was like well they're set in like a forever christmas small town so it's like you know 24 hours a day 365 days a year christmas town and that's like my favorite thing to build out is like a tiny little town full of just absolutely ridiculous characters um so it was really like it was one of those things where we like joked about it and we had so much fun talking about it and we were like right we'll write it one day and then like two weeks after we got home it was like do you want to write it now <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to cheat on all of our other books? <laughs> Just write it now. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was, it really did save both of us though at a time when we were both really struggling through our writing. I mean, it was like the height of the pandemic. Um, like everyone was just miserable. No one was going anywhere or doing anything. And at the same time, like we'd also both been writing for quite a while and we're starting to feel like this like plateau type feeling and getting to write with your best friend is like getting to like perform for your best friend if that makes sense it's like I made it's like when you're a kid it's like I made this play and now I'm going to make everyone in the house sit down and watch this play that I made but you get to do it for your best friend <laughs> and so it's just full of like inside jokes to each other and really like the first draft of this book was just solely to make each other laugh our asses off um and also to be like oh my god that's so hot do it do it more <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can like, I feel like we were already bad at saying no to each other, even as friends where we'd be like, Hey, I found this pair of hot pink, like Barbie pants. Should I buy them? Like, yes, yes, you should. Or like, I found this ridiculous water fountain for my cat. Should I buy it? Like, yes, yes, you should. So as soon as we started writing together, when one of us would have a crazy idea, the other one was like, yeah, yeah, we should absolutely do that. Cause we're really bad at saying no to each other. We truly are like it's to the point where we force our families to go on vacation with each other and it's just <laughs> it's it, it's turned into a thing. <laughs> oh my gosh and I have to tell you this this book is like spicy Hallmark movie like you know what do you think a Hallmark movie should be like it's spicy enough like you know Diablo um pepper <laughs> you're not like not jalapeno like diablo <laughs> you know like and the antics like the idea of having a production company where people from the adult entertainment are helping out you know what is the crossover brought this antic <laughs> so what was kind of the research to think about like how did a production how to create a producing a movie you know looks like you know well I will chime in before we have our real answer and I will say part of our answer was a rom-com author named Nisha Sharma yes. who is like the holiday movie librarian she has like an That's amazing so spreadsheet uh, that she's built out with all of the movies every season that are coming out and you know, a lot of these channels have now like uh, fall themed movies, spring themed movies, like they have them for every season and she's got a spreadsheet for everything. And so she was actually a really valuable resource just for insight into things like production time. So a lot of these holiday movies have really quick production turnaround, turnaround times. Like this is not Avengers Endgame 
you know, type of time commitment that the studios are putting in. They're very, they're very fast. And so like a lot of that information was really useful, but a lot of information also came from Julie because Julie has a movie made of one of her books. So a lot of things I'd be like, Julie, is this what a screenplay looks like? (laughs) Yeah. So, so Dumplin' is a movie on Netflix. And then although it's not going into production, I also wrote a screenplay for a movie for Disney. And so I did have some, sort of I had enough knowledge to be able to like fill in the blanks and make it look like we knew what we were talking about but like I'm sure if like a really top-notch film person came through with a fine tooth comb they would be like that's not what craft services does (laughs) (laughs) but you know it's 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 good enough and here's the thing about Hollywood and the film industry I have so much respect for these people. It takes so many people to make even the worst movie happen. But at the same time, if anyone deserves to kind of um, be made fun of a little bit, it's people that work in the film industry. (laughs) Yes. All right. So we actually haven't talked about what is the elevator pitch of the book? So (laughs) we're going to talk about everything else, but I think maybe our listeners should know what is, what is the book? Are we just chaos monsters? I'm so sorry. (laughs) No, no, no. This is great. (laughs) Okay. I'll do the quick elevator pitch for the book. Is that okay, Sierra? Yes. She's so good at it that I make her do it every time. I'm like, I don't know words. You do it, Daddy Julie. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, that's so hot. Um, Okay, so the quick pitch for the book is that we have our main characters, uh, Bianca Hobbs and or B Hobbs and uh, Nolan Shaw. B is a adult film star who has always wanted to dip her toes into mainstream movies and her the producer that she works with in the porn industry is uh had this genius idea to diversify his efforts and to start getting into holiday christmas movies because like we said it's a very similar production quality and timeline although i mean let's be honest like a porn is filmed in like three days but you know it's it's similar in a lot of ways uh so b sees her opportunity to get involved in these movies and she uh, is basically semi-accidentally cast in this upcoming holiday movie that he's doing called Duke the Halls. And uh, she is cast opposite her childhood best, or not childhood best friend, oh my gosh, no. Her childhood crush, uh, who's like this sort of like reformed boy band, bad boy Uh, named Nolan Shaw and she shows up on set and her one goal is to just keep her identity a secret and to just kind of like remain under the radar but do a good job and she gets on set and the only person who knows who she is is Nolan because he is one of her biggest fans (laughs) yes and more gets revealed but no one no one knows but don't but everyone knows but no one knows and no one wants to talk about it you know it's like this comedy and then the people who support the staff because there was a mishap are people who work in the other industry and they're they're trying to avoid telling you they work in the other industry but they are working right. in the other industry <laughs> yeah yeah one of the fun parts of the book is the reason that there's this whole um like that b has to like rush in and take over this role is because the girl who was starring in the movie is part of like an accident at like a music festival and so she can't be there and there are also people on the production team who are there and can't be there as well so not only does our porn producer with a heart of gold have to fill in you know with his like main starlet but he also has to find a few other people to fill in the blanks um and i will say that costuming a christmas movie is much different than costuming a porn so there are, there are some interesting folks just trying to do the best they can with the resources they have <laughs> <laughs> yes and as i said this is a uh, in the spice level this is diablo this is like it's a spicy there's plenty of scenes um, it's great to listen to it, but you should have your headphones and no kids, you know, on the drive, you know, or <laughs> go in a drive through and order Starbucks and just basically, you know, bust out that the audiobook. Yeah, I will say that like it's definitely very, very spicy, especially on the Julie Murphy scale. But on the Sierra Simone scale, if you are a Sierra Simone reader, yeah. I would say it's like middle of the road for Sierra Simone. It is, it is, I agree. It's but middle of the road. I think for the general reader, it is pretty spicy. <laughs> I know yeah. people are like what he's not a priest there's only <laughs> two people all right I guess three chili peppers <laughs> yeah yeah and your and your scale Sierra is probably like just a regular you know regular 
yeah bread and butter you know I'm like, like this is this is innocent this, this is, is traditionally so published innocent. that's probably why it's traditionally no. published but yeah yeah you know. but for christmas romance it is spicy because typically christmas romans are very tame just like hallmark movies or just have a kiss or go fade to black and then just like happily ever after you know um so i'm glad that you're delivering what actually it's my most popular um, podcast ever is spicy holiday books so <laughs> <laughs> people are looking for this market so i'm glad you guys are delivering to it that's awesome that i think makes... one of the things we really oh, said one of the things we really set out to do from the very beginning was to have like a ridiculously funny feel-good book that mm-hmm. was just so horny <laughs> um so i'm, I'm glad you're we delivered <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes all right so are you working on something together again is this is this magic gonna happen again or I yes I think we can say uh that we are working on a follow-up that is like a companion standalone so it's about a different couple but it is characters that you've already met or heard of in a merry little meet cute and we should say that Nolan our washed up boy band hero he was in a boy band called Inc. that had three members. And so our hope is that each member of the boy band will get to be a hero in one of the books. So I know for sure in book two, we have our boy band hero. His name is Callum. And he is a Midwest pizza mogul. He owns a pizza franchise called Slice Slice Baby. And <laughs> he's he's a little bit of our sort of dad bod character. You know, like he was sort of the the extra kind of member in the boy band that was like really comfortable and easygoing, but he wasn't like the heartthrob or the bad he boy. He was the Joey Fatone. Just say yeah. he's Joey Fatone. <laughs> 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 Who is a Florida hot dog mogul now, I believe. <laughs> or no at idea. least he has like one hot dog restaurant, I think. <laughs> this makes so much sense. Oh my gosh. I love the fact that you're bringing back the boy bands of what happens to them and how, how they're happily ever after because I I come from the boy band, you know, era of Backstreet Boys and Sing, you know, like even New Kids on the Block 10 years before that. And so now like, yeah, I don't know, these kids these days don't have that. They may have BTS and stuff like that, but it's not the same, you know. So I love the fact that they're getting their happily ever after in your books. You know? Yeah. I think what really made it is that it felt like the whole pop moment was about boy bands and then like a few like female starlets, you know, like Britney and Christina and Jessica and Mandy. And like, it just felt like there was this whole universe, like all of my music that I consumed came out of these sort of Orlando pop machines. And it was like, it was my whole world. It was. You were making the band, watching that when they yes. had the, they had the O Town making the band. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, how could we forget? <laughs> but every Friday night, trying to figure out how the O Town was gonna make it work and how they were gonna come together and put it all together. Oh, reality TV goal. That, that was the God. drama. That was the drama. <laughs> it's so true. Yes. All right. So let's chat some book recommendations. Do you have any books? Actually, no. Let's chat about what are you coming up individually. If, if you're bringing, if you're writing anything else or bringing something else individually too. Well, in like a totally like opposite direction, yeah. hard left turn. Um, next year I have, so next year we'll have our second Merry Little Meet Cute Christmas Notch, whatever you want to call it book uh, coming out in the early fall. And then I will actually have a new middle grade novel coming out in June that is about a fat camp that is potentially probably maybe run by vampires (gasps) um (laughs) who are trying to like essentially like farm plump made in the usa children um (laughs) it's it's been a lot of fun to work on and then uh in the late fall i think november is what we're saying um i have a pic my very first picture book is coming out called chubby bunny and it's about if anyone's ever played like the playground game chubby bunny where you're stuffing marshmallows in your face and yeah. like every time you stuff a marshmallow in your face you have to say chubby bunny um it was one of my like girl scout childhood favorite games so it involves marshmallows so of course it was um but that's what's on the docket for me next year what do you got going on sierra 
What don't I have going on? Um, I have an anthology coming out uh, in November. That's a historical anthology, and it's the last in a series of historical anthologies I've done. Uh, the first one was called Duke I'd Like to F, so that was DILF. <laughs> we did another one with Rakes, and then this, this year it's Villains. So I wrote like a dark, dub Connie a uh, sapphic romance between an Anglo-Saxon abbess and a Norman invader. And I know that the kids are clamoring for more Anglo-Saxon abbesses. So I'm here, <laughs> I'm here to deliver what the people want. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit off the wall for me. And then um, I am currently drafting the first in a new trilogy. So I had a trilogy a while ago called the new Camelot trilogy that starts with American queen. And it is a contemporary kinky, queer and polyamorous retelling of King Arthur. So instead of there being a love triangle between Arthur, Guinevere, and Lancelot, they're all in love with each other uh, and they all get a happily ever after. So I just had so much fun writing that that I'm doing the same thing with Mark, Tristan, and Isold. So I'm starting the first book of that now. And that should okay. be out, I think, in like July of next year. All right. I was I was enthralled with New Camelot with that or that trilogy. <laughs> like you had a choke call on me and I was just like, I can't, I can't, I don't understand. This this is like this I'm like, I'm amazed. The third book was just like something, and I was like not expecting it. <laughs> hey, well, I'm back, baby. I'm I'm here to do it again. <laughs> so I'm glad. <laughs> awesome. So all right. So do you have any books to recommend our listeners to pick up? Yes, I'll go first. I, cause I have a few that I really love. And I, um, when we were like getting ready to do this podcast, um, I was actually kind of thinking about books that I think do setting really well, because even though I mostly write contemporary, I tend to be very setting driven, which is one of the reasons why Julie and I click so well. Like she mentioned, she loves to build like a setting, a world, like a small town with lots of quirky characters. And I am the same way. Like I just love building a world and kind of populating it. And so there are some books that I think are just so good at that. And one of them is called After Hours on Milagro Street by Angelina Lopez. And Angelina is a Kansas girl like myself. And this uh, book is set in a small town in Kansas called Freedom. And it is just this amazing city girl comes home to small town kind of story that we see a lot like in Hallmark stories, right? Um, but it is super spicy, uh, super inclusive. And it's just this really lushly, beautifully, sensually, sensually told story about someone trying to navigate family and like, close knit and let's say maybe a little bit nosy <laughs> neighbors in this small town as she's trying to take over her family's bar and the hero is a professor and he is so swoony so cute okay so i i have a couple of recommendations but the book recommendation that is like like people will probably still hear me whispering it from the grave or like at like my wake one day like when they come visit me in my coffin i'll be like have you okay so god shaped hole by tiffany di bartolo is my like annual reread it's the i do not reread books this is the book i reread every year um to read this book is to know me so god shaped hole is about a very skeptical woman who doesn't really believe in the idea of like a one true love or anything like that and then one day she sees um like an ad in like the wanted or like the want section of the newspaper or something like that and it says um I'm looking for a friend for the end of the world and that's all it says and she's very intrigued by this ad and so she calls the ad and these two people set up a time to meet and it's just angsty and sad and hopeful and their love story is so like, I don't want to give anything away, but it's just so painfully tragic in like the most delicious way. Um, so I read it in my twenties and was, and I was like, no one will ever know how I feel in this moment. Um, and then I discovered that like tons of other people love this book. So I guess I'm not that special, um, <laughs> but I do love this book. And I have met Tiffany DiBartolo who's written the book a few times and still to this day, like I can't make eye contact with her. Like I just, if we're ever at a book at event at the same time, like I just have to pretend she doesn't exist, which probably makes me look like an asshole, but you know, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I interviewed Tiffany a couple of years ago and it was actually one of my favorite interviews I had. Um, 
Estelle Halleck, who's a publicity manager at Forever, she's like a huge fan, and we both like tag team. And it was like one of those like like talking to her, I was just like amazed. Like even she was like, yeah, like even the books, like it's just word of mouth, like all this like stuff. And I'm like, it's it's amazed to see this, you know, this author like basically like this work still resonating yeah. years later. God, yeah. she's so good, and also she's just cool. Like she's yeah. a very cool person. <laughs> he like, really I feel is. Like Every time I like interact with her, I'm like, am I inside of a movie right now? Like, yes. are you real? So yeah, I love her. I love that book. Everyone go read it. Yes. Um, do we have time for more? Can well, I say? Okay. More? okay. So another book that I really love, uh, like one of my top reads of the year I read it was last year because I got to read an early copy, but it actually came out this year. Uh, But one of my top reads of the year, it's called A Caribbean Heiress in Paris by Adriana Herrera. And it is set during, it is historical. It's set during the 1889 Paris World's Fair. And so what I love about it is like, it's historical, yes, but I think that it's a historical that we really haven't seen a lot because a lot of historical really sort of bends towards the UK and kind of towards the Regency period, like there's a smattering of Victorian, but really I think Regency has this kind of, you know, chokehold on historical. So to see this like late Victorian historical Belle Epoque Paris was just amazing. And the World's Fair was this like really incredible event that I actually hadn't known a whole lot about. It's like when the Eiffel Tower was erected in Paris and all of this stuff, but it's about this rum heiress, La Zalana, and she is coming to Paris to sell her rum. And then she ends up meeting this soon to be uh, Duke. And he is the swooniest, handsomest uh, hero I've almost ever read. And there is a romantic intimate shot we say moment on the top of the Eiffel Tower that is worth the price of admission (laughs) sold yes Adriana always delivers you know that's 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 a a guarantee she's gonna deliver that yes and I should say she writes contemporary and historical so if you're like oh I just don't know about diving into historical her contemporaries are also just as sexy just as amazing Mm -hmm. uh just as like incredibly and brilliantly written yeah Okay, my next recommendation is for anyone who has an Emily Henry itch to scratch. Um, Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. So I just picked this one up. It's kind of cheating because I'm not fully done with it yet. But I already want people to talk about, like, I already want to talk to people about this book. So here we are. Um, (laughs) So it's about two writers. One of them is an erotica writer and one of them is... I'm blanking, but another writer, a not I, I think he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think he it's writes like, a, like the, you know, the sort of like literary elite kind of books. Yeah. yeah the snooty stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So they had like this sort of like tryst, like one like weekend, like, or one week of like being in love basically when they were teenagers and it was super heated and just intense. And then they haven't like spoken for years and years. And they are like forced to basically be in close proximity again for this short amount of time. And like the past begins to unfold and you realize that they've been essentially like writing like to each other in their books, like after all this time. And it just like, just the thought of that makes my face hurt. (laughs) Um, So yeah, seven days in June, I'm not totally done with it yet. But that just means that you can come get in my DMs and talk to me about it. Um, <laughs> highly, highly recommend. It's so good. And it has a child that I did not annoy me. I actually love the child. <laughs> I think it's because the child's like a teenager. Yeah. So like they're yeah. like, they're pretty like sarcastic yeah. and like witty. Like they're mm-hmm. so much fun. Yeah. Oh God, that's, so true. that's a resounding uh endorsement by the way it has a child that didn't annoy me annoy me (laughs) it's just so good I I don't know it's it's a romance it's like people people question it it's romance you know Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's just so so good and it's a perfect companion if you have the itch for Emily Henry this is the book you need to read this is why I totally agree and also like as an author who works in publishing I didn't realize it was a romance novel at first based on the cover Mm -hmm. so I feel like the cover is like amazing and stunning obviously but like I just thought it was a totally different kind of book so whatever you think it is it's probably not and you should pick it up and read it like right now yeah 
Yeah. Okay. My final book, I promise, and then I'll stop. I used to be, because I used to be a librarian, I'm always like, here, I've got books for everyone to read. Yeah. But my final one that does just amazing things with setting that I really love is called Strange Grace by Tessa Grattan. It's actually a YA fantasy, um, but it does have a happily ever after of, of sorts in the YA fantasy sort of paradigm. Um, but basically it's about this small village that is kind of like in a fantastical Wales where nothing bad ever happens and everyone is good and healthy and safe all the time uh, because every seven years they sacrifice their best boy to the forest. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the price they pay uh, for having this perfect village. And, uh, but one year when, like, you're supposed to sacrifice the best boy every seven years, but one year the Grace Moon rises early and they're going to have to sacrifice someone to the forest like years too early and they're not ready. So these three main characters, there's a witch, an outcast, and the person who's obviously going to be the best boy. Um, they are trying to figure out what's going on. And it's like queer and polyamorous and just gorgeously written and very creepy. So it's very good as we're kind of edging closer to Halloween. It's like a really good Halloween read. It's so good. It's so, so good. I need to add this to my queue. That's that's a must die. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have I actually have two more books. I'm gonna be really fast though. Okay, so th- and then I'll and then we'll that's be fine. done. We'll be done. That's fine. Right. That's fine. Okay. Take your time. <laughs> okay, two more and then I'm done. Um, okay, all the feels by Olivia Dade. If you have not read this series, it's her spoiler alert series. Every book has like a Hollywood spin. Um, and this specific book is about basically like a super cute dude bro kind of guy um Mm -hmm. who's a little bit a little bit uh not so smart um at least that's how I read him just like a a cute kind of big dumb guy Mm -hmm. um and he's starring in like this Game of Thrones type show and the girl that he like our main character is a ER therapist who is basically just totally done with her job totally like over it and very like like uh tired and exhausted and so she lands this cush job thanks to her cousin on the set of this tv show with this very cute big dumb guy who keeps getting into fights because his fists are always in the way i don't know um but (laughs) she lands a job being his handler and so it's like this like opposites attract like workplace romance super cute super steamy and also like the cover art for this book is adorable and so cute so I always recommend Olivia Dade she's like one of my go-tos so pick up the spoiler alert series the good news is when you fall in love with this book there's going to be more to read because she has the third book coming out soon and then my fourth and final recommendation I'll be really fast is Dating Dr. Dill by Nisha Sharma okay like, like I mean <laughs> we can't talk about like our Christmas book without talking about Nisha and also like dating Dr. Dill is just so great. Here's the thing. I can curse on the show, right? Yep. I'm so used to being in YA world. I'm like, can I say bad words? Can I say a baddie? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're fine. I could not give a shit about Shakespeare. Like I don't care about Shakespeare. All my friends are like into Shakespeare and go see like Shakespeare in the parking lot or whatever like I don't care about Shakespeare but I do care about all the different Shakespeare retellings so like the surge of like late 90s early aughts Shakespeare rom-com movie retellings like 10 things I hate about you there's more I'm sure that the one you like she's the man she's the man it's the 12th night retelling Ugh. yeah okay okay this is what we <laughs> Shakespeare in the parking lot friends if you can't tell um but anyways as soon as I found out that this was a Shakespeare retelling I knew I was gonna love it even though I hate Shakespeare um so this is part of the if Shakespeare was an auntie series that Nisha launched with dating Dr. Dill and it's just like is it enemies to lovers can we say it's enemies to lovers it feels like enemies to lovers yeah yeah they yeah. have some enemies to lovers they have like an interesting they have a good me cue but then they just the second me cue becomes enemies you know yeah, he, yeah. he has strong feelings about love yeah so. it's taming taming of the shrew is that what you call it in shakespeare language yes i, but I would okay. say i would definitely point people towards 10 things i hate about you if they want yeah sort of the like emotional energy of it because taming if i wrote taming of the shoe shrew i could actually put like you know spanking and stuff into it but like taming of the shrew is a tricky story i think to have a, your hero remain sympathetic throughout the whole story but it i what i love about dating dr dill 
and also 10 things I hate about you is they find a way to get that same sort of fun push and pull um, between the two leads without there ever being a moment where you're like, I don't want her to spend any more time with this guy, <laughs> you know, instead, <laughs> like he's amazing. Yes. He just has strong beliefs about love. You know? Yeah. In that it doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> Which and is I the love... best thing to do for a romance where I'm like, I'm going to prove you wrong. I know. Right. Like we love those heroes that are like, love isn't real and you can't make me fall in love because it's not real. And then we're like, we're just going to watch. What is this trope called? It's not like fake dating, but it's like, we have to date for like the greater good. Like oh, what is that but... called? Uh, I think it's just called fake relationship. Yeah. Fake relationship. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love this energy because like I'm all about being a mogul in your own life. And like, yeah, I'll date you to make my own life better. <laughs> accidentally or money. You. If you give me money for dating you, I'll date you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, it's professional this time, you know? <laughs> and we should say there's a second. So there's going to be a second. Uh, if Shakespeare was an anti book, and I actually, I'm blanking on the title right now. Uh, but you meet those characters in book one. <laughs> Yay. It's a, it's a series. It's a whole, it's a whole energy. So we got, we got whole energies here. So, um, so, all right. So Sierra and Julie, tell us where you can find you online. You can find me on Instagram at the Sierra Simone, and you can also find me on my website, the Sierra Simone.com. As Julie will attest, I am a little bit of like a medieval hermit. <laughs> and sometimes it can be like, I'm not online a whole lot, but if you email me at the Sierra Simone at gmail.com, mm -hmm. I will eventually get to the email hopefully one day. <laughs> yeah. I, you're, you know, this is a podcast, so your reader or your listeners can't see this, but I actually have a Sierra Simone picture on a stick for what I need to do, like, like promotional things like online <laughs> and she's unavailable or like, you know, can't be found. I, yeah. I have my Sierra on a stick, Sierra um, on a stick. but yeah, I, you can find me anywhere at, and I'm Julie, basically Twitter, Instagram. I'm, and I'm Julie zero on TikTok um and then on our joint website where we have like all of the information for like our upcoming book tour and stuff like that that's juliansierra.com oh you're so smart to mention that book tour come <laughs> I to totally see forgot about our website. i don't know when this podcast comes out next but if, next monday <laughs> oh, oh perfect okay well we're gonna be in where are we gonna be we're gonna be in dallas dc boston chicago la and then we're doing a virtual event with blue willow that is totally free registration. You can pre-order signed copies of the book through just about any of those stores. Go to our website. It's much more detailed and, you know, better at explaining this than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sierra and Julie, this was delightful. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you. Yeah, this thank was you so great. Thank us. you for having us. We, this is like our favorite thing to do is like talk to each other's faces and talk about books. So it couldn't yeah. be better. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't even need a podcast to do that. <laughs> <laughs> if you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to share with friends, subscribe, rate, and review the show. This is the easiest way to support the podcast. For a list of books mentioned and other romance recommendations, please visit watchwinextblog.com. Did you know you can purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore? With LibreFM, you can pick up more than 250,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from real booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company, you know the name, but you'll be part of a different story, one that supports the local community. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to squeeze more reading into your busy life. Listen with the free LibreFM app while you do your chores, walk the dog, relax at home. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen next, check out recommendations from people who know the best booksellers. The Watch Your Next podcast has a special offer for our listeners. Get to audiobooks on LibreFM for the price of one with your first month membership. Use code WHATCHYOURNEXT. The offer is valid only for new members in Canada and the U.S. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.